It's the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. This is Kyle Hyman, and joining us to talk about poetry, a book on poetry, which isn't just some poetry that he wrote, but also a, a great guide to poetry, is Dr. Anthony Eslin. Thanks for being here, Doctor. Well, thanks for having me, Kyle. Before we get into this, what is your thought, or how do you feel about rap music? <laughs> well, I think uh, I think God can make use even of it. Uh, <laughs> Perhaps, if for nothing else, than to uh, punish people down in purgatory. I don't know. Uh, no, I, I, to be serious about it, I think that it, it expresses, uh, this is a thought that uh, the Catholic poet Dana Joya put in my head uh, last year. It, it expresses the natural human desire to do interesting things with language mm. and to produce something that we might call music. Now, unfortunately, in the case of rap music, and most of it is bad poetry, sure. um, not very good as poetry, not very good as music, but the desire is natural there. Mm. And the shame is that truly popular poetry in English died with the death of Robert Frost since, since Frost's death, and maybe Carl Sandburg's death uh, a couple of years later. We haven't really had a genuinely popular poet in English, and most poets don't write for ordinary people. They write for... I don't know who they write for. They write for each other. A uh -huh. uh, very small, closed circle, that is. And you say that this book, you didn't write it, and you don't care if the, the critics like your poetry. You say you're not writing for them, you're writing for you. Uh, so who is you, the you that you did write the book for? Well, ordinary Christians, ordinary Catholics, people intelligent enough, and I think that would be most people, intelligent enough to appreciate a work of art, uh, a song, for instance. It's, it's the one big poem mm -hmm. that is made up of 101 different poems, and 21 of them are hymns written in the traditional style of Christian hymns mm -hmm. with the music specified. And uh, I mean, I think anybody, and anybody going to a church can appreciate that kind of poem. That was the ordinary person's most regular and immediate experience of poetry for centuries. You went to religious service and you sang these poems. Sure. Well, most of that is gone now, too, because we sing stuff that isn't very good at all as poetry. It's just twaddle most of the time. But ordinary people could do this. I'm, write, I'm writing for the ordinary Christian, ordinary Catholic who wants to read songs for the Lord, 101 different poems uh, of three major kinds, hymns, uh, short lyric poems, most of them are short, and 12 long dramatic monologues, all focused on the life of Christ, the, the dramatic monologues, the life of Christ. So people, yeah. um, people speaking who knew Jesus or who are part of the first Christians, first century, or reacting against them. Yeah, and with these hymns, if you take the music out of a hymn, is there any difference between that and a poem? Not too much if it's a really good hymn. Okay. Right? A really good hymn should be able to stand on its own as a poem, as a complete, a small but complete and coherent work of art. And I know because I write about this all the time. I, the, the old writers of hymns, that's what they thought that they were doing. They were writing poems. And the poem had to make sense as a whole thing. And each line had to make sense as its own line. And, you know, everything fit together. It was a work of art. And, but this, these works of art that were hymns were meant to be sung. And so there are certain limitations that are on you. If you're a writer of a hymn, you, you have to be writing things with the, the knowledge that people are going to be singing those words. So unless the words really can conveniently be sung, um, you, you, don't, you don't put them in a hymn. So a hymn has uh, got to have it, um, a, a sort of noble simplicity to it. Hmm. Um, the language has to be immediate, uh, direct, um, often concrete, uh, powerful, okay? Um, and that's what the great hymn writers always did, and that's what our hymn writers the last 50 years don't know how to do, because they didn't, 
they said to themselves, you know, we don't have anything to learn from those old guys. Uh, we we can uh, we can reinvent the wheel, and they invent they they invented something square with bumps. <laughs> You give like this really in depth and detailed explanation on how to read poetry and a little bit of history of poetry in different styles. And you, you really mentioned how important it is that you read it with the right tone or the right uh, rhythm. What are some of the suggestions that you have for somebody who's reading poetry? What, what's the right way and the wrong way to do it? Maybe. Well, okay. A couple things. One thing is that, you have to be at your ease. You have to have some leisure. Let's suppose that you were going to the Sistine Chapel, right? And right now, these days, if you go to the Sistine Chapel, you're going to be herded along with a couple hundred other people, mm-hmm. and um, you're going to kind of get the idea that you better move on. Move it, move it, move it. Yeah. Um, as if you were being yelled at by a Marine Corps drill instructor. Uh-huh. Move it. Um <laughs> But that's not the way. That's not the way to view those paintings. I think people people do know that. If you want to look at the paintings of Michelangelo, you've gone all the way to Rome, right? I mean, what the heck are you doing? If you're <laughs> going to spend ten minutes in the Sistine Chapel, that's crazy. So if if you can, you would you would sit down, and you would you would look up. Maybe you would maybe you would need a guide these days. You'd need a guide to tell you what scene you were looking at. Mm-hmm. But um, with the guide there, uh, you would you would look, you'd be patient, right? Um, you wouldn't you wouldn't, you wouldn't click off uh, you tick off boxes on a list. Okay, saw the creation of Adam, check. Uh, saw the creation of Eve, check. Uh, that you would understand that you'd be better off just going having a pizza someplace. <laughs> um, well, it's the same it's the same way with poems. The poem packs a lot in a very short space. So the way to read a poem is to read it and um, be patient with it, think about it, maybe read it again. Um, Read it aloud. Read it aloud after you've read it silently and read it aloud as having meaning. Um, All of the poems that I write are meant uh, to be read aloud. I don't write Mm. in free verse that is in unmetered poetry. I write always using traditional English forms and meters. And they're meant to be, the the hymns are meant to be sung. And I specified the music to which to sing them Mm -hmm. because I I composed them with the idea in mind that they would be sung to that particular melody, um, whichever one. Um, The others really are meant to be recited aloud, meant to be heard. Uh, The dramatic monologues, I mean, you've got to recite them aloud because those are people speaking uh, in dramatic situations. There's Peter speaking after he has denied Jesus, and 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 he's 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 uh, beside himself with with grief and despair and self accusation. It's it's the uh, dramatic monologue spoken by Peter after the denial, but before the the resurrection. It's on that terrible night. I asked myself, well, what would Peter say? What would he say to himself? And um, this is my attempt at uh, at getting at that moment. Well, how do you read that if you just plow right through it? Oh, uh, uh, I'm a worm and no man. Uh, okay, all right, just <laughs> plow right through. Uh, that's not how you. That's not how you would do it. Um, you you maybe read it, read it again, read it aloud. Read it aloud as if it, you were Peter, um, and then things come home to you in ways that they otherwise wouldn't. But that's that's that that would have been the common experience of poetry that most people had until. Um, until about the middle of the 20th century. Hmm. We're talking with Dr. Anthony Eslin. The book is The Hundredfold Songs for the Lord, and it's a great primer to poetry at the beginning, but then he launches into uh, a collection of poetry, making up one long poem. Was this an easy thing for you to write? <laughs> no. Um no, I, I, I had I've done a lot of translating of poetry into English verse, mm-hmm. but uh, writing original poetry I had largely set to the side for the last twenty years, and um, so I returned to it, wondering if I still had some of the old muscles, and um, found out that 
in fact, the old muscles were still at work doing doing all those translations, and um, also that I had learned as a teacher of literature for all these many years. I'd learned a lot. Um, I'd learned a lot that I could then apply. Uh, and um, well, one of the things I learned from teaching medieval and Renaissance poetry is how how wonderfully intricate and and complex and beautiful were the designs um, that these guys had for their long poems or for their collections of poems, that everything was going to be in just that spot and no other for particular reasons. Hmm. Um, and I said, well, I wonder if I could, I wonder if I could imitate that. Uh, and well, that the hundredfold is the result. It, I mean, it, I asked that question because it's so complex. I mean, you get the the rhyme scheme and the rhythms and everything like that. It's not just writing a story or or writing a free verse poem. It's it, it's very detailed. And even like you did some interesting things. I don't know if you want to break down a little bit of like the the math that you did with uh there's like things adding up oh, to 100 yeah. and you you describe it it's like a whole paragraph of how the math works out for it. Yeah, that then that's another thing. All the all the great medieval and renaissance writers of things that were long like like uh, for instance Dante's Divine Comedy but other things too. Um they all um they did these crazy things with them with with uh uh, uh with proportions and ratios and and um and numbers, okay? So uh, I'm taking my lead there from Dante and the other poets. Uh, there are 100, 101 poems in the hundredfold. That means that, well, there are actually 100 plus a 100-line poem as the 101st, which is sort of farewell poem to the whole thing. Um, I have it structured precisely the way a Baroque composer would have done it. So right in the center, right in the center of the whole thing, there's a five-hymn section um, on the Passion and the Resurrection of Christ. Um, with the first two hymns and the fourth and fifth hymns, each of five stanzas, and the middle hymn, the central hymn of the block and the central poem of the whole work. So it would be the um, uh, right, right there in the middle of, of 100. It would be number 51 if you counted them all. 51 would be right dead center of 101. Uh -huh. Is an eight stanza poem about the resurrection because eight is the number of the resurrection. Christ rose again on the eighth day. That's why they built, in the old days, that's why they built baptistries octagonal. Uh -huh. And churches were often octagonal and baptismal fonts were octagonal because Christ rose on the day after the Sabbath, which was the eighth day. And Augustine said eight is the number of the resurrection. Mm. So I, I had to put it there, um, along with all the other important numbers like 33, which is traditionally the age uh, uh, at which Christ was crucified and, and rose from the dead at, at his age 33. Um, Dante uses that in his Divine Comedy too, and many other many other things. All there, just waiting to be picked up, waiting to be uh, discovered. Yeah, you also have like some things that you didn't mention that people can find on their own. So. That's right. There are, there are other things too. Yeah, I used a, I used a, uh, I used a, uh, um, throughout. I used something called the Golden Ratio. Um, I don't want to get into that, but it's all over the place. <laughs> All right, well, where can people get the book? Um, well, they can get it and, and toothpaste uh, at Amazon because everything <laughs> can be gotten on Amazon. Um, yes. But they can also get it from Ignatius Press directly. Uh, it's published by Ignatius Press and it should be on their book lists too. All right, again, it's The Hundredfold Songs for the Lord. Thank you so much, Dr. Anthony Eslin, for sharing a little bit about poetry with us. Oh, thank you, Kyle. It's been fun. <laughs>